been in ministry for how many years? I mean, how long ago did you help start the church with? Uh, so the Rindle? church started in 1980. I was on staff by 82. Okay. And so, so that's, that's a long time. A, that's 40 years. Is it? 80, yeah. Yeah, 42 years. Wow. Okay. Is there a point at which you feel like, okay, I've done these things. Now I can do, I don't have to be on the door. I mean, is there a, a point where you feel like, okay, I serve, but I already did that part. Yeah, I don't think serving is never redundant. Right. It's just okay. the expression of it. Mm. So I don't think me going on a door would be a great idea. People wouldn't know what to do with me. <laughs> Plus, I'm probably not the right person. I'm too melancholic. Oh, uh, okay. You want a Valerie on the door that yes, actually your wife. appears to like people. Yes. <laughs> if it's not so Whereas I get people sometimes saying, Does he even like me? Does he even like me? <laughs> so I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long have you and Valerie been married? 13 years. 13 years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when you started the church with Phil Pringle in uh, Sydney area, Northern Beaches, mm -hmm. what was it? What, DY, is that the first place? Mm -hmm. Surfers, uh, like a little surf thing. There's a surf life saving club. Yeah. Typical Australian, you know, red, red and yellow outfits. <laughs> and we actually rented a hall that was like the surf life saving kind of community hall. Yeah. And, and the funniest thing is in the building, the, the guy who was the caretaker of the building lived upstairs in the building and he eventually withdrew our, our lease because he wanted to listen to his movie on Sunday nights and we made too much noise. Oh, really? We were noisy Pentecostals. You were noisy Pentecostals. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get into that a little later. but <laughs> So you helped plant that church and how did you meet Phil Pringle? Phil uh, actually was my youth leader. Really? So in, in Christchurch, New Zealand, he had had a remarkable conversion, mm. both him and Chris. And then... Uh, about two years later, he came to a, uh, a church that, that uh, I had just gone to through my parents. And so Phil very quickly became, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say he was a friend at that stage, that would be assuming too much, yeah. but he became my youth leader. Yeah. And I like to remind people nothing's changed. <laughs> he's, now you're youthful. Leader. He's still my youth leader. <laughs> so we, we were part of that church that he was the, wow. the youth director. Yeah, isn't that something? And he was impressive then. Yeah, because I've seen some of those photos. So so you grew up and you went to school in Christchurch? I grew up at uh, a school called um, Burnside High School. In Christchurch, mm -hmm. which is South Island, mm -hmm. which is basically far south. Uh, middle of the island. Okay, but but they've got the mountains there. Yeah, the, uh, the Southern Alps run right down the spine they of the... call them the Christchurch the, Alps. Uh, no, just the huh? Southern Alps. This is the Southern Alps. Yeah, and they're and significant so, mountains. Yeah, well, that's where the U.S. ski team would actually go train in the, in our summer. <coughs> Excuse me. In our summer, they would go train in uh, Christchurch in those mountains. They'd go to Queenstown. Mm. Yeah, is that where it is? Mm -hmm. Queenstown, Christchurch, all that? Cool. Yeah, so, so you grew up uh, in the Southern Island. So Kiwi, you grew up Kiwi. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. That's fascinating. There's a whole bunch of us. Yes, We were is. eventually exiled. Yes. <laughs> they couldn't sent, stand us any longer. Sent to the penal colony of Australia. We were sent as, as, as um, yes. We were the rejects or the detritus of, of New Zealand. We were sent to Sydney. Now, now Phil, well, and Chris went, sent. Phil and Chris went a couple times to plant, right? They did. Did you go the second, first time? Uh, no. Okay. No. You, went to, you were younger. We actually rented their house when they went. Really? So they went. They were going to go for life. Uh, and, uh, the call of God was very real about Sydney mm. to Phil and Chris. The timing was the was the issue they yeah. struggled with. Right. But you don't know until you go. Yeah. So they went, and then after five months, and we were just settling into renting their house off them and looking after it. They came back. Really. And broke the lease. <laughs> broke. <laughs> never forgave him. Yeah, never. I'd so had his garden issue. all nice and clean, <laughs> and now he says, "Oh, thanks, Simon. I'm coming back." <laughs> In fact, uh, right now, today on this podcast, we could probably draw up a little contract where he could pay you back. Uh, he owes you on that. No, my lawyer's the speaking to this. Lawyers one. are still, your yes, solicitors my, are still working my on this. talking about yeah, this. Yeah. So, uh, so he's been able to push this off, kind of like uh, President Trump pushes things off like that. In the same manner. Oh, I know. Not okay. with this. We, we not won't with even this, put that not in with the, the same, same bile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now, the second time, so then Phil and Chris. And you and your wife, Helen, mm -hmm. moved to Australia. Did, mm -hmm. did anybody else go? Was it just a, two was couples? A girl, no, there was a girl. See, by that stage, Phil had also planted a church just outside of Christchurch. Mm. And there was a girl called Alison Easterbrook. She's a delightful young lady. And she was a really good worship leader. She's one of those given-to-God worship leaders. Wow. 
and she was a piano player. So the five of us left. Okay, and you guys moved to Sydney. Mm-hmm. And was it, did you know where to plant? Was there already kind of a plant, Northern Beaches, where you, no, DY, no, it just, just the place became available? Yeah, it's like, you know, it's this weird thing is, Phil had gone to a church on what they called the North Shore of Sydney, which is not mm. the Northern Beaches. It's further okay. inland. And when he came back, when he felt that they were really outside the will of God, and he was most troubled about it. So they returned back to, back to Christchurch. Mm-hmm. But when we, when we went there, it was like, I don't know, the best way of describing it, to me, it was like a calculated guess. It just seemed like we liked the area. Something about it attracted us, particularly Phil. And so we went there. Is there, uh, as we're following, and, and I love that, the, the whole alliteration of, actually, I love the way the shack did it, where the Holy Spirit was uh, uh, like Black a, female. Yeah. Well, no, that was God. Uh, it was a, oh, right. it was something that was like a butterfly or something. I can't remember what he did on that. But the fact is, is that is that we have all many of us likened following the Holy Spirit. To, I think Mark Batterson called it the Wild Goose. Yes, right? I remember the book. And so, is there some of that in following God as a follower of Christ, where it's not all predetermined? It's not just one rail of a plan. Yeah, I yeah I, I believe that personally. I don't think mm. I don't think the apostle Paul had sort of a predetermined plan about every journey he went on. Yeah, he just went and followed his nose, and as we know, he got to some places, and the Spirit said no. But yeah. not until he got there did the Spirit say no. Wow, he wasn't in Jerusalem. The Spirit said, "Don't go there." Mm. He just discovered on the journey. So he went. Okay, this is Abrahamic. Yep, not knowing where he's going. Yeah, And so I think that was the same with us. We didn't really know what we were doing, but we had this internal conviction that we're on the right track. Okay, you had, okay somebody described it uh, the other day to me. They said uh, he knew he had the will of God because it was a voice a little bit louder than his self-talk. Mm. <laughs> you know, and then it just felt right. Peace, if you will, peace being the umpire for doing the will of God. Yeah, I, I don't think it always is personally. Sometimes the will of God is, will of God is done in very dispeaceful moments, but essentially. But a peace in your heart. So that's a, what I mean. There's, a, con- know, there's a, a settled conviction. Yes. Yeah. That's fascinating because it's it's uh, for some of us. Okay, let's say that we were led to a certain area to plant a church, and we, God, we really like this area. Well, I was taught as a kid, if you're following the will of God, it really can't be something you actually like. Yes. It has to be something. Oh, God. I remember these uh, little campfire moments where you would uh, stand around as kids and, and throw a pine cone in a fire, and you would say, I will follow the will of God no matter how bad it is. Yeah, look, I mean, that's to me is like an overdose of sincerity. Mm. But I think it's a good attitude. Yes. we Look, I think some people go to areas because they're easy. Mm. They know they can poach other believers, mm. and I, I have questions about that. But I think unless you like where you're at, you won't like the people. Okay, that's huge right there, because really, it, at the end of the day, it's not the, the location, no. it's the vocation, which is you're called to love that's right. people. I loved Australians. Yeah. You know, I realized after years, I just loved Australians. I I, I've changed, not that I don't love them, because I've traveled and lived in so many different places. Yeah. But yeah, and I and I think that when um, w- it's an interesting, uh, the, the converse of it is interesting. So we knew a couple who were in a city and they did not like the people. Mm. They did not like the people of that city, and that that eventually meant that we had to ask them to come back home. Mm. Because in other words, they went to plant a church, mm-hmm, and they eventually did not like the people. Well, then that's a simple that's a simple way of looking at it, but that was the underscore. But I think, you know, the complex things are solved in in simple obedience. So there is that side of the coin, which is very simply, if you don't like the people, this is not going to work. No, because they know you don't like them. Yeah. So your gospel <laughs> ministry, <laughs> yeah. your gospel ministry ends up becoming like something that you know, oh, I do this because of Jesus, yeah. Yeah, 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 rather than I do this because I have a love for these people. Yeah. So you you moved to uh, you moved to Australia. Uh, Love the people. Moved to the, did started the church in DY. Okay, one of my one of my favorite stories actually is uh, Brian Houston, who who we know has built a great church there. But his father was a minister, 
And uh, I love the story of, of you and uh, Phil going along to his place. And there was a service that, that uh, uh, you were going to be at. He's speaking. And if I remember the story correctly, it, it was basically sort of like he, he was one of the church leaders in that city at the time. And uh, you went along, and you, you're the young church planters. And you're looking for this affirmation, this moment of... And if I remember this correctly, uh, he, he waited till the very end. You're waiting for him to say something. Hey, here they are, you know, pray over you and whatever. And my understanding is uh, Frank basically said, had you guys stand up and said, here they are. Well, boys, give it a go. Look, I actually We're, don't remember that. Yeah. But that sounds like Frank. But that would have been Frank's <laughs> affection. Yeah, Because true. the fact that he stood you up meant that he believed meant in you. Meant something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I do remember him saying is that, um, he was referring to Phil. I, I was total unknown because mm. he, he knew of Phil from New okay. Zealand. And uh, he said, if you live on the northern beaches, I would encourage you to consider going to that church. He was very yeah. kind. Oh, that, that is kind. Because he lived on the other side of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Right. And there okay. are people who have never gone north okay. over the bridge the in bridge. all their life. So yeah. it's a very real divide. But I just love that one little phrase. And, and yeah, he probably was gracious in that sense because that, that's the legacy of grace. Uh, he was cynically funny. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Well, which was somebody you would embrace. Yeah, it's easy yeah. for me to be able to. <laughs> easy for you to love. <laughs> oh, yeah, easy. You lived in England for 10 years. We did. You must have enjoyed that in I some ways. I loved England. Yeah. I do. I, uh, the English are, uh, are interesting. Um, they're very slow to make good connections mm -hmm. and friends. But I loved living in England, and we loved Europe. And yeah, well, we, we, I mean, I had never planned any of this. None of this is an. I didn't have a ten-year plan. We just ended up there, and we ended up. Our movement grew wonderfully, grew from thirteen to nearly forty churches. We had wonderful connections with our pastors. Well, let's background that for just a, just a bit for somebody who doesn't know C three churches, which started as a Christian City Church, right? So, and, and then the, the abbreviation is C3, Christian City Church. Mm. And call to the cities, the greater cities of the world, if you will. That's kind of been the the. That's what I've always thing. thought of it. And that's where my uh, license is as a minister. Uh, maybe I haven't re-upped it lately. I need to think about that for a second. But, um, and then my son Brandon pastors C3 Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. This is a fantastic church. Mm -hmm. And for the last couple of years, you've been the overseer for North America. Mm -hmm for those group of churches. But that, out of, so out of that church plant in DY, uh, a group of churches begin to grow. And, and how many churches now worldwide? Um, this is terrible because I'm in the, in the final You're stages the of my thing. involvement but, uh, with C3 as an as a, um, exec member. Um, I think it's between 550 and 600. So it, it just blew up all over the world. It did, it did. And, and it wasn't planned. When I meet young pastors who say, I want to start a movement, I'm thinking like, you're nuts. Yeah. You've got no idea. That's not a goal. No. To plant churches is a great goal. Yeah. But to be the head of a movement, to me, is incredibly self-serving. To want to be. That mm. was never our goal. We sat down. I remember sitting down in this room. This, this, we rented this industrial complex area. Uh, just a particular um, unit of it. And we had, that's where our church really started booming. Mm. And that was, it was in... Uh, DY, it was the back of an industrial estate. It was not on any good transport routes, which blows all the theories about right. accessibility. Where you have to be and People go and if that. God's doing something. There you go. And so we were there. I remember sitting in this room and the thought Decapolis, Decapolis which was the 10, the ten cities. cities, I think, in the Mark Galilee five. area. Yeah. And so we thought 10 cities. That was our goal. Really? 10 cities. So to start with... Um, a couple of guys from the, in the Sydney region started to connect with us. And then we started to see God did something significant and unforeseen where all these people joined us over the next 10, 15 years who many went out to become church planters. Really? It wasn't planned. Phil's a good leader and a good preacher. Yeah. But this was not something in his brain. Yeah. It just started to explode. Just a God thing. And then you went with where God was going. And we thought a church of five, he thought a church of 500 would be like, I can die and That's live it. in peace. We're good. Because in Sydney in those days, except mm. for um, Brian's father, there were no large churches. Yeah, the larger ones would have been Adelaide and Brisbane maybe. 
They were. At the time, yeah. Maybe CLC and 800, and, uh, 1,000, 1,200. Evans's down in Adelaide. Well, they're now bigger than that. But in those yeah, of days, course. Yeah, but in those days, a significant yeah. church was in Adelaide under a man called Leo Harris. Mm. But when you look back at the records, it was about 600 people. Yeah. But that was significant. Yeah. So Phil thought that would be awesome. So it just started to develop. What we ended up doing, Paul, is we ended up giving pathways and structures to something that God was doing. Right. We didn't start with a pathway and a structure. And ask God to bless that. No, no. We ended up putting riverbanks on an already flowing river. Come on, man. That's huge because particularly in our Western mindset, and particularly U.S., where I live, We'll come up with these huge ideas and mm. projects. Mm. And then, God, can you bless this? Can you fill this river? We've built the banks. Mm. He goes, yeah, you know, the river's going that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, that's troubling in one sense, isn't it? Yeah, um, but it's happened. It's happened a lot. In this country. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Because I can think of one man who in the, uh, the COVID era got huge online, huge in, uh, like he had this plan. Uh, we're going to take every, in this particular city, we're going to take every single uh, theater, theatrical complex, put a church in each one. It's going to be fantastic. We can rent it out because they're still open. Okay. And uh, so we started doing that. And if you will, uh, I, I believe the Holy Spirit blew on it. Mm. But he had basically built this thing that was outside his ability to uh, deal with it in his character. And, and uh, you know, it's the, the thing we know that your talent can take you beyond your character. And so what happened is the whole thing blew up because his life blew up. Yeah. Well, the answer to that is not to have too much talent. <laughs> <laughs> so I think if we go I'm around sorry. promoting, we are now going to do a Bible school for the talentless. And uh, it's filled with people. <laughs> it's filled with people. It's filled with talentless well, people. A, yeah. And the, the difficult thing about doing a school for talentless people, it's like doing a conference for serving we're going to do a serving conference. It's not about leadership, but serving. You get three people to show up. Yeah. Leadership, boom, I'm in. Or, le- or prophetic. Oh, prophetic, yeah. And we're all out there wearing our prophecy T-shirts, bright colors, <laughs> Andy Worrell's Campbell soup can, so I'm noticed. No, no I'm not, I'm, I don't believe that totally. But, yeah, I've often thought that. Do we a, are a funny, conference aren't we? on being the second man. We Let's are have funny. a conference. Yeah, well, but we're funny on that stuff, man. And it does tip us over. And you and I were talking uh, just before we started our conversation on video. Uh, the city of Babel built a tower. Why'd they build a tower? It says to make a name for ourselves. You know, I mean, among a small group of people in one sense. I mean, right? Because they were not, we were not scattered until after that. They all spoke the same language. And uh, they built, this is a fascinating thing, and I think uh, Dennis Prager talked about it. He said, uh, he said they built a tower to, to make a name for themselves. And when God looked at it, God, God was so large, he had to come down. So God came down. So they were never able to be what they thought they could be. But we have this propensity in us for that, don't we? Oh, and how absurd to build mm-hmm. a tower, like poking your finger at the universe. Yeah. Or, <laughs> really? You know, well... Maybe that starts that whole thing. And how do you deal with that thing in us? We do want to be liked, right? We want to be. Oh, I don't know part anybody who's sane that doesn't want to be liked, right? Yeah. So how do we keep that from bleeding into uh, speaking a message in which we're we're prophetic or whatever it may be, but we dial it back because ah, I don't want to offend anybody. How do we walk that line? Yeah, well, I mean, the only way I know is I think our boldness should be about what Scripture says. Mm. I think we're bold about Scripture, then I think we're on a safe path. But if we become bold about plans and processes and principles and about what we're going to do, I think that tends to be a less safe path. Look, there's the, there's the, there's the mystery in the heart of man of who can know mm. except God why one person turns out straight and another person turns out corrupted. After all these years, I don't have the answer. It's fascinating, isn't it? There's a, there's a conundrum in that. Yeah, there's a brokenness in humanity that's way more dangerous than we think. It is. It is. We do. And again, I, I come back to that whole uh, thing. Uh, my professor, well, I would say also a mentor, Lynn Sweet, he said uh, in the book uh, The Well-Played Life, he said, uh, God, God doesn't love you and have a wonderful plan for your life. He has a plan for mankind and a purpose for your life within his plan. Mm. 
And I love that feeling because it is now. You can now then go to DY. It's sort of, we think it's up there and we're coloring and we're going outside the lines because you know why? Because there's no lines. No. Right? No. So there's, so the, the lines are righteousness, right? Gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit coming out of our lives. So, so you, you, you moved to Australia. You guys built great church. Churches come out of that, 10 cities. You're with your wife, Helen, mm -hmm. and Helen becomes ill somewhere in that journey. 25 years in? Yes, years so in? we went there in 2000 and... No, sorry, 90, 1980. 80, yeah, 80. So I've spent most of my adult life in Australia. Mm -hmm. So I think of myself as Australian. Yeah. So we, and then in 2005, out of the blue, because she'd always been well, she'd always been a healthy spirited mm -hmm. person, she was diagnosed with third stage ovarian cancer, mm. which in largely is the same way of saying goodbye. Mm. So on my son's side of the family, there are a number of doctors, and they were surprised she even made it to Christmas. And the diagnosis was in August. Wow. September. September. And so she lived for five years with that. Wow. She had over 100 chemotherapy infusions. Mm. And in the end, you just can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, chemo, I, I am not an opponent, opponent of chemotherapy if it works quickly. But where it drags on and on and on, you're only prolonging life. You're never going to save it. So after all of the, after five years... She went to the doctor. We went to the doctor one day and she said, I can't keep doing this. And he said, I understand. I think you're right. He said, let's get back together in another three or four months and let's re-look re at your future. He knew what was happening. Yeah. But he was kind. Yeah. I always appreciated that about that the doctor. That is kind. Yeah. He, he, I knew what I knew and Helen knew. Mm. But he just gave you that sense of we're not sure yet, which stops you worrying so much about tomorrow. Takes away the anxiety. Mm. If you will. So she passed away five years to the day of her diagnosis. Wow. She was only 53. 53. Which is stupidly young. Yeah. Very. And she was a young, vital person. Mm. So the, the children were without their mother and I was suddenly a widow. Yeah. Suddenly single mm. in that sense. So, uh, so how do you, uh, you know, I've got these quotes, uh, grief observed, you know, C.S. Lewis. And, he talked about, in fact, I, I wrote one down. He says, we were promised sufferings. They're part of the program, part of life. Less are they that mourn. He said, I, I've got that. He said, uh, of course, it's different when it happens to oneself. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, we've got great philosophy. Not to others. Uh, for others, of course. In I've, reality, I've got all the answer for you. Yeah, as soon here's as how you should walk me, through it. I'll tell you one of the things that Christians do in that light that I find funny. If something bad happens to me, it's the devil, but if it happens to you, it's God. It's a test. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. I love that. Yeah. It's so inconsistent. It really is. It, what that says to me is we can't cope with um, an anomalies. We can't cope with, uh, if you will, the randomness of humanity. No. Yeah, there, and there is a randomness. It's, uh, I actually have a book coming out about the life of Gideon in which the second chapter is about randomness. And that there are things. And how do you cope with that? How do you cope with mysteries? How did you, you know, you and Helen, because uh, I, I remember uh, praying with you guys. And I remember praying over her mm. with a group of people. And uh, I, I remember uh, the peace that was on your wife. Mm. You know, and I remember those, those moments of prayer and prophetic word, if you will. You know, this is, we're going to, how do you deal with, how do you walk through that kind of grief as a follower of Christ and a person that is looked to as a model for a follower of Christ? Because mm. that's what mm. you're a leader of churches. She, she was. How do you walk through that um, when, it, when it doesn't happen the way you think it should? Well, I think, first of all, you have to realize that life is unfair. Mm. If you don't reconcile that life is unfair, you're going to be in a constant anger or frustration with yourself and with God. We live in a broken world. Our resurrection, the, the, the completion of our salvation has, is, is yet to be. Mm. And that's in the resurrection. So I, I understand those things intellectually and theologically. And, but the, the weird thing is that people, uh, good pe people that I still to this day love and respect, told me, Helen's going to live. God's spoken to me. Mm. But I just say to the, this is my thinking, we all want her desperately to live. Yeah. 
And that's going to get confused in your brain between what you want God to do and what's actually going to happen. I, I'm of the conviction a lot of what we think is God speaking to us is experience. Some of it's good, some of it's wise, it's scripture. But to say that God told people that Helen would live, so clearly they're wrong. Clearly, yeah. Uh, and, but I never uh, held that against them. No, but they I wanted her to don't live. we say things to people like that? I, I, it's called pious friend, platitudes to me. A wonderful friend, Andrew, that just passed away of ALS. Uh, actually, in this taping, it happened yesterday morning at 7.01 a.m. And, you know, there were there were times in his journey going through this that you just go, okay, dude, this is going to happen. Yeah. I'm with you. Totally. You know, because... You want to be that person of affirmation yeah, we're hope and givers. encouragement. Yeah, we are hope givers. We're hope givers. It's it's sort of like it's an, it's it's uh it's almost an academic. It's a no, it's an epidemic in Christianity. Hope giving, it's wonderful, and anyway, I don't despise any of those people that said that. No, I I agree. What's the difference between hope giving, and fantasy? Uh, when you, when I figure that out. I'll come and let you know. Oh, come on. You, I was probably, going to write this stuff down. No, I'll probably become the wealthiest man on the, on the universe. I was going to write this down. I was going to have like, this would be in, because I was going to put it in a book as so a friend of mine once told me. You know, no, you can't do that. <laughs> I want the royalties of that book. Um, I, I don't think I can tell easily. I think, well, here here's how we can tell. By the mm. fruit, you'll know them. Yeah, you only know you by the end result. Yeah. It's interesting that Jesus said that. You don't know a person by their their affirmations or their intentions, mm. you know them by fruit. By the fruit. And the fruit of it is that she passed away. And that journey was not a journey that we despised. Yeah. I got to see her for another five years. Yeah. She got to celebrate uh, my and mm. my 50th and hers. Wow. And she was quite well for hers particularly. Oh, she got to celebrate great. the uh, marriage of our youngest daughter, Kate. Wow. And then the, the knowledge that Kate was pregnant after that. So there was, there was a lot that came out of it. Special that, moments. Yeah. That was special and rich, and we didn't despise them. You know, I've thought about this, you know, uh, a lot, actually. Uh, I had a friend, Raymond, that had a massive heart attack. He basically died, and then uh, over a two-day period, a prayer and kind of some techniques with doctors that they tried uh, brought him back. He lived one year to the day, just passed away a couple months ago. And I think about that. Seems and I such think a about, pity doesn't all that energy huh? for just one year. Yeah, I think about uh, Raymond, <laughs> and I think about uh, a friend of mine said this. He he had a, a friend pass away, and and uh, a friend was consoling him, and he said it this way to him. He said, "If I told you, I'll use Raymond. If I told you that Raymond was in another country, so far away, and so deeply ensconced in it that he can't get communication out. If I told you that he was there and that he was doing well." And he was in a village, and he's bringing Christ to them, and he's doing well. But you're not going to hear; from, you won't be able to hear from him for years. Would you be okay with that? And the guy says, "Yeah, I would be okay with that because at least I'd know." And then the man looked at him to his friend and said, "Well, that's where he is. He's just, he's just here. We're here, and it's there, mm. right? Yeah, it's here, and it's there. Yeah, and it's just that close. I, I do uh, love what." Um, I forget his name. He wrote the shack, and how remarkable that story was. It's just, it's just here. It's just there, you know. And and um, and then how do you? So now, now you walk through that. You're a single dad. Uh, how many kids were still at home at that point? None. None. So everybody's no. out. My youngest was 23 or 24. Okay, so everybody's out by that point. And, uh, and but you start moving in ministry. Right? Uh, I took about six weeks break. Hmm. You know, I probably should have taken longer. Yeah. But I'm a man. What am I going to do? Sit there contemplating my navel and writing about <laughs> writing a journal of my own sorrow all day long. Yeah. So I got I yeah. got back into stuff. People were kind to me. Mm. I, w- I was given ro- room to breathe. I could set my own pace. But there was no... Uh, Helen would never have wanted us. She told us quite specifically a whole lot of things. But she would never have wanted us to sit there and waste our lives... Um, wishing she was still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would not be her intention. Yeah, yeah. So she would want us all to go on, to grow up. She told me, before I died, you need to remarry and don't wait long. You're a uh, useless single. <laughs> you see, so she both encouraged and rebuked me. <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. You know, this that whole thing of, of uh, somebody uh, passing and 
being here, there, just here, there. Um, there's that. There's that sense of. To me, there's the difference between hope and fantasy. Okay, fantasy would be, oh yeah, there's somewhere and somebody will see him. Hope is my hope and my because of my faith, which mm. is built with hope, right? My faith knows she's with Christ. Yeah, and that's the difference. I agree. So what worries me? So I have a conviction in me that she knew Jesus, mm. her sins were forgiven. And however she is with the Lord, which is way beyond anything that I or anybody else could ever describe. You know, I, I don't even un- begin to understand what that looks yeah. like. Yeah. But the, the difference between that and this kind of pious um, platitude that's, that's rolled out every time, oh, I'm j- I know they're just looking down at you and from heaven and cheering <laughs> you on. Yeah. When there's Surround no the act of faith whatsoever, yeah. just a hope to stop, yeah. to avoid, to help them avoid the terrible reality of what could be. Yeah, yeah, that's true. To me, the, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that whole looking down from heaven thing. I know we're surrounded. I hear by it all the time. It's such yeah, nonsense. Yeah. But I th- thank you for saying that because I think it's creepy. It's hopeless nonsense. <laughs> I think it would yeah, be yeah. creepy. It's looking down from <laughs> heaven. Like, yeah, upon you, know, you who are living wrong, yeah. and upon they who had no faith in Jesus. So it's it's a it's a kind of a remnant of the mm, Christian culture. Yeah. So uh, and I want to get into a couple of these other things, but I want to want to talk about this for a moment. And then, so now you uh, you meet Valerie. Did you go to England and then meet Valerie, no, or no. did you? How did this happen? Well, Valerie, stri- the, the wonderful thing about this is that Valerie was a member of C three Manhattan with Stephen Mel Hickson. Stephen Mel Hickson, and she was like a vital member of the church. Oh, really? She wasn't involved in anything specific. She mm. would helped out with the children. She would have helped out in greeting, but she ran a business. And Stephen Mel said, "Run your business, Val." And Valerie had great influence. She had influence rather than position. Well, she's a force. She has uh, she a, force. A, a spirit of kindness and love and energy around her. She does. That no matter what group she would be in, she would stand out. Yeah, as a child, she was the leader of the pack. Yeah. So she's like, yeah. that's her personality. Yeah. And her So she's part of Stephen Mel Hickson's church. So, and I went there, and because. We were ministering in our churches in America. Right. We happened to love the Hicksons and still do. Yeah. And I, love them I very went much. there and then, and here's the weird thing, Paul, is that my son at that stage was working in the church in New York really? with his wife, Deborah, and, the, and our three grandchildren. Really? And they were friends of Valerie. In fact, Valerie used to take the girls who are just preteen, she used to take them to American Doll, which is this big shop. In New York, <laughs> and she would Whatever. take them out and treat them, and American so she doll, was she was a which friend. Which means her business was doing well. Yeah, her business. Yeah, yeah you yeah. can't go to American Doll without not, some not cash. Easily. Yeah. And so, and she would, and then she would also she invited them out to um, Shelter Island, which is out to the east of Long mm. Island, on the North Fork of Long Island, and she would um, essentially shout them accommodation for a few days. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. So this a is a friend. So yeah, but they I mean, but her. this is a good friend. Good, yeah, yeah. You didn't know her, no. This is amazing. She wasn't in my radar. She's right. blonde. She's from New York. She was not on my radar. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. Yeah. Right. Okay. This is what you had prayed about. That is amazing. So you met Valerie at the Hickson's church, and she was already friends of your son and your grandchildren. Yes. Yeah, so my and his wife. My family. My, my two family. daughters yeah. didn't know her, but my son yeah. and daughter-in-law did. And they loved her. that fascinating? In fact, they worked in the same building as her. Because she allowed, she gave part of her office space to C3 Manhattan. Wow. She gave it to them for nothing for a season as really? office space. Really? Yeah, so she paid the bill and they got use of half yeah. the room. Half the space, sorry. That is amazing. And so you and Valerie met. And uh, and so how much, how long did that, you dated? Which Had she been married before? or No. She she'd been married. single. And so now you guys dated never for a little so while. So we've never faced the Brady Bunch. Yeah. <laughs> which is never the Brady Bunch. Yeah. Um, so I would say within possibly a year and a half to two years. So v- Helen died in 2008. We were married in 2011. So that was nine. You met a year just later. Just a, and it was just, yeah. I met her about a year Three, and yeah. a half later. So... Okay, so now at but, the church. but you dated at the church. But you dated for a year, over a year? No, it wasn't that long. Okay. Maybe it was 
So I'm thinking people that are I don't remember times you know, in their forties or fifties or whatever at the time. Uh pretty, I was in my mid fifties. Yeah, you see you're pretty decisive at that point. You're pretty like, yeah, it's gonna work, not gonna work. Well, do you know what helped it? And people find this unusual, is that I had befriended another girl and it was never going to work. And nothing ever happened. There was no there was no future. But you know, I was single. And you don't realize how screwed up you are after your wife dies. Mm. So people told me years later, you were, you were screwed up. Mm. But I thought I was just rational Simon, but clearly I wasn't. Mm. So I accept that. And my kids had to live with some When you of say that. screwed up, what do you mean? Oh, you messed up emotionally. You know, you're not... The way you react to things? The I way you know. make decisions? No, no, because my decision making is pretty... Is largely We're good. Still, yeah. yeah, pretty... De- I'm decisive. Yeah. No, I just didn't know myself... Mm. it's like when I started dating Valerie, it was like I was 18 again. And it's that great flush of that. So when I first saw her... But you didn't say some of the stupid stuff you would have said when you were 18. No. Yeah, okay. So there's that. No. (laughs) No. And we didn't do anything. A little older. We didn't do anything stupid. Yeah. And I didn't say anything stupid. Yeah. But we got along well. But there was that same... Eventually, yeah, not straight Flash away. Things, really? She came to the party quicker than I did. I'm not saying that to belittle her at all. Mm. Um, but she said to me, I'm in, are you? And I said, look, I think I am. Can you just give me a little bit of time? Yeah. Just let me process. I, I, I think I'm nearly there, but I couldn't say yes. And here's the weird thing. that She dropped me off at the airport. I was returning back to Australia. Mm. Before I walked off the jet air bridge onto the plane, So I was still technically in New York. In New York. Not on the plane. I said, I'm in. Really? Yep. Right. And uh, and, I never changed my mind. Yeah. Well, that's good. (laughs) Because you're married now. That's right. So when you you get married, saying you're going to stick is a really good thing. I also, I've never had divorce in my family around me. Yeah. I never faced the concept of divorce in my first marriage. So I don't have that out or that path in, as a groove in my brain. Yeah. So uh, so now you and Val are married, go to England, oversee churches, pastor, uh, do what, hand it off well. Uh, we've got the C3 group of churches in Europe is doing very well. Very very healthy and well. Yeah. And Great couple leading it. Yeah. Steve and Lisby Warren. Yeah, Steve and Lisby yeah. Warren. Brilliant. And, uh, and they're out of, well, they're out of England. He's English. Right? They're both English. They're both English. They're both and then they Somerset ended up and Devon people. They, were they with, were they first in in London with Herbertson at that thing? Were they and no, then went to no they went, Amsterdam? No, no they went they went from a church in Winchcombe, a little village hmm. that joined us. They since left, which was, uh, that worked for everybody. That yeah. wasn't an issue. But Stephen Lisby became the they were the prize of that relationship. Okay. And another and another uh, person as well, um, and they went and helped out James in, in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, James so had this Amsterdam. growing church, right. and then James left through right. sadly left, right. and they took over that church. Okay, but they're very English, so okay. for them to live no, in I knew they were English. The I just, I, I, you it's, know, it's a cost to them. Yeah, but now their boys are oh thoroughly my. Dutch. Oh my goodness! And and the churches are doing well, and it's growing. Really well. And now, then you come to Miami and uh, overseeing uh, Americas, moving into some new places, as you mentioned. But one of the things that that you do, and you do very well, uh, is you write. And you just wrote a book, and I want to mention it. it's uh, Joshua: Lessons in the Wilderness. What I learned when no one was watching. So it's great time. And what I did when nobody, when, when everybody was. <laughs> right, everybody, and what I did when everybody was. So because uh, this is a fascinating study. It's a great book. So I'm going to recommend it to everybody. Thank that's you. Why, and you can get it on uh, Amazon. Amazon around the world. C3 yep. probably has it somewhere. No, and no so, just on Amazon. You just, just on do, Amazon. No, you know Amazon prints you one copy and send it to yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So Joshua Lessons of Wilderness. And so it's Simon McIntyre, M-C-I-N-T-Y-R-E. So that's also, uh, you also have a website, simonmcintyre.net, is it? Mm-hmm. Simon.mcintyre.net. Okay. Yeah. And that's where I do blogs and provocative things. Right. And you wrote, uh, you wrote one about the wilderness, okay? And then it's also in the book on Joshua about the wilderness. Mm-hmm. 
and the wilderness, and he said this, the most obvious example of the wilderness, he talked about temptation of Christ, something happened in the wilderness, something changed, straightened, fortified him. This is really, I love the way you, you picked up this change. He went into the desert full of the Holy Spirit, and he came out in the power of the Spirit. The difference being that gift is given or filled while character is obtained. So the gift is given, character obtained over time. And uh, a couple other things. I'll read, read a couple things that you said. Um, we're slow to change, perceive things. We're much slower than we care to admit. And caring to admit is also one of our problems. And it says the soul walks. This is, this is brilliant in this uh, chapter, by the way. Uh, wilderness slows us down internally and gives us space for the working of God's creative and redemptive Holy Spirit. We learn to listen to or see ourselves more clearly. Most of us, if as productive, let me just say it that way, Westerners really don't like the wilderness. We push back on it. Mm. We look on uh, Moses and the children of Israel and Joshua and his wandering in the wilderness as a non-productive time. Like, like, what is it? Was it 40 days walk and it took them 40 years? Yeah, apparently only 40 days journey at the most. Yeah, at the most. And in fact, came around, you know, the second time, came around once to the place supposed to, supposed to go across the Jordan, came back a second time. Uh, what is the wilderness to you? What does that mean? And and how do we how do we uh, how do we pull ourselves back from this chaotic life and a life in which we are taught be productive? How do we how do we unplug from productivity, or are we unplugging from productivity? What's the wilderness to you, Simon? Yeah, my and how problem. Does that my problem is that I don't, for us. I don't think anybody unplugs. I think people are forced into. Most people are forced into a wilderness because we don't naturally unplug. We don't naturally Sabbath. No, because we think that Sabbath is a complete waste of time. Mm. I'm, not, I'm not talking about the religious notion. I'd say of the time. Western culture is, is yeah. that. It's like we don't need a Sabbath. Work hard, do well, believe God. It's like it's just, we're sort of caught in this treadmill. One of, look, if I could... I, I, it's, it's not easy to answer your question because I'm not sure we recognize wildernesses that mm. well. They did, of course, because it was physical. Yeah, It was a terribly unproductive time for most of the people. The generation that disbelieved all died in the wilderness. Yeah, Anybody So people say, 20? well, wilderness is a places of death. Well, hold on. The wilderness is where um, Joshua became who he was. Yeah. So it depended upon, it depends upon a lot of things. And it was the wilderness where Christ and my son Brandon, in his brilliant uh, study on the wilderness, talked about how he said, isn't it unusual that you baptize somebody and then say, hey, why don't you just go off to the wilderness and be tempted for 40 days? That would be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the wilderness. you know. Uh, I think the wilderness faces us with ourselves mm. and it straightens us up. How do we, how do we wilderness I mean, how do we do that? How do you unplug? Let's make it personal. How do you do that? How do you and Val do that? How do you guys well, Sabbath? How do you find that? How do you find space? Um, you, know, you know, it says, uh, the Bible says, where two or three are gathered together, there he is in the midst. Mm -hmm. And it was pointed out to me by someone years ago. That means that God always shows up in the spaces in between. Yeah, yeah. That's. I think that's a clever reading of it. But Yeah, how do we find that? <laughs> um, well, how do you find that? Well, I take Saturday off. I just do nothing. I watch a couple of games of English Premier League. Yeah, but that's not godly. Um, depends what team you follow. Depends <laughs> what team. <laughs> that's right. Um, I mean, I, I mean, is it? I don't think it's ungodly. I think it's just, it's just, unchill, it's just chill. So chill, Sabbath, whatever we want to call it is part of being healthy. I, I deliberately don't go into my office and read emails. Mm. I don't. Um, I'm. I'm a great fan of reading theology texts. I don't do that on a Saturday. Really. Sometimes we may go and do something for fun, but otherwise we just chill. Yeah. I might do some washing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, know, just yeah. bits and pieces. Life stuff. But also, I think more importantly, we get we do have holidays, mm. and uh, it's quite hard for Valerie to unplug because she's the business she's, owner. Well, she's American. 
So, and she's uh, a business owner. Yeah, and she's a business owner. And we as Americans, we have two weeks vacation, and we don't take one of them. No, well, that we staggers the rest week. of the world. Yeah. That, I mean, to yeah. me, that's so unhealthy. Yeah, exactly. It the is rest of the, the rest of the English-speaking world has four weeks a year. Yeah. Very few people take a month at a time. But yeah. at least they take two but weeks. I, but I do have friends. You know, I, you know, my mutual friend, and he's on our board of directors, Michael Murphy, uh, he, he'll write me from Bali or something where they've taken a vacation. I say, oh, that's awesome, man. How long are you there? And for me, like exorbitant it would be, like, like crazy would be eight days. He goes, oh, we're here for about, uh, we're here two and a half weeks. And then, you know, now he is texting me. He is staying in touch with his assistant. Mm -hmm. There's that. But it's like, uh, but for him, he knows this is his place of health. And the wilderness for Joshua was his place of coming to age. Yeah, yeah. This, yes, I, I, I can't fully describe what a wilderness looks like. I just know what he learned in the wilderness. I'm sure we've all had wilderness seasons. People talk about wilderness seasons. Mm. Sometimes it's just because you made a whole lot of bad decisions and things are going wrong. Mm. <laughs> Other times it can be because God literally prunes you back to make you more fruitful. It's, if our relationships with Jesus, we're going to be okay anywhere. If it's not, we're not going to be okay anywhere. You said uh, in the book, again, another place, um, preachers who find their messages in dark and obscure seasons and become famous easily retreat from their own sense of reliance upon God and inadequacy of themselves. In the bright sunlight of constant demand and exposure, they become soulless and parched. Their signature message easily becomes the reason for their singular decline. <laughs> did I say all that? Did I? Yeah, it was, it was really good. <laughs> so it's no like, idea what I said. okay, here's what it is. It has to do with seasons of fame. It has to do with, boom, he, he was in a dark spot, found a word, and that word became his message. And then that, that book, I remember uh, there was a guy who, he actually traveled for a couple of years. This is in the late 80s. And uh, it was a book called, uh, it was a book about being burned out, okay? And uh, it wasn't like Wayne Cordero's great book on that. It was was, a, it, was it Gordon MacDonald? No, no, Ordinary Private World. No. no, it was a guy before that uh, where he did this whole, thing and it was about burnout i forget the name of the book but it was on burnout and he did a series of conferences and after a year and a half conferences he, he tipped was, over he was burnt out <laughs> he burned out oh, on his own oh, no. his own message it's terrible yeah yeah that's it's ironically funny he's responding he's responding to the crowd rather than setting the tone okay there you go okay now we're now you're you're yeah. hitting that thing there so I was just reading in John 6 mm. when Jesus did the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Yeah. At the end of it, they were so excited about what he could do for them, they decided to force him to become a king. So he just left. In fact, his disciples didn't even know where he was. Yeah. And that's why they went back on a boat the next day, next, that night, Capernaum, because they must have thought, we don't know where he is. We don't know what's happening, but we've got to get home. <laughs> so, so he... he Jesus deliberately avoided um, premature limelight. He walked away from fame. We walk to fame. Now, look, Paul, I've never been famous, so I'm talking partly academically, but I've seen people... But you're infamous. I've seen, so is that. I've seen people who've said to me personally, mm. when they became well-known, it was intoxicating, yeah. it went to my head, yeah. and I traveled too much. Yeah. Um, it was fascinating. Years ago, we had a guy who did, I won't mention names, it's unfair, but he did mm. marriage ministry. Mm -hmm. And his stuff was superb. Oh. Superb. But he was on the road all the time. Is that a Jack Hayford's church? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Guess what happened? Yeah. He's, no. he's divorced. Yeah. It's, <laughs> his, uh, his marriage ministry wasn't being lived out. Exactly, because he became famous with... So he ends and up, we're all clamoring, the machine, speak, And the machine speak, ends speak. up running him. Yeah. So, so how do we walk? Okay, so now how do we walk? Be it's a, a personal question. How do I walk the razor's edge? I, I don't want that. I don't, but I also want this ministry that we do with Christian Men's Network. Dangerous Nations, the stuff we're doing around the world, the things that God's doing, the groups that are happening, the Father's lives that are being transformed and changed. I want people to know about it. Also, you know, I, I need more partners. I mean, we, 
I'm fine with, I'm really satisfied with what's going on, but I'm dissatisfied. Because I'm dissatisfied, if you will, for the children whose dads are not transformed right now, mm. who are walking back into really difficult situations. I'm, I'm uh, really desperately, um, I agonize over the lives of young men and women who are being abused. And, and, uh, and I, I just know that if we could just get enough guys doing enough stuff, somebody's going to walk across the path of that dad. I, I don't believe there's one man beyond the reach of grace. How do I walk that razor's edge, Simon? Of I, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to, you know, I don't have this desire for a million followers on social media, but I'd sure like a million people to see it. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, sometimes I think a burden tricks us, though. I, the, to me, there's something in, in what you're saying that um, this is the way I read it we are important and unimportant. What you're doing will be picked up by others. Mm. And you burning it, I'm not, I don't, I know you don't, you burning mm. yourself out to reach one more person mm -hmm. is, is of no value to that one more person. So I think there's got to be in something in us that says, I do what I can, I don't burn myself out doing it, and allow God to look after the gaps. That's, my, uh, that's uh, how I would uh, look at uh, it. No, I think it's a brilliant answer. My... Uh, uh, you know, and I think about that, the whole burnout thing, because my father's generation was ta basically taught that. In fact, he was taught, you sacrifice everything for the kingdom of heaven. And he almost sacrificed his family. You know, I wasn't a great athlete, but I played athletics and I did a lot of stuff. And uh, we remember, my dad and I talked about it later as uh, he began this Christian Men's Network ministry. And we kind of grappled with some things even then when he started this, I would have been, uh, what, in my uh, late 30s, early 40s. And he and I sat down and talked about it one time. And he, he didn't come to any of my sports games. We tracked back. We could only think of five games. I think uh, two baseball, uh, one baseball when I was in college, one baseball when I was young, uh, one football when I was young, and two basketball when I was in college. And that's all he could remember. That's all I could remember him ever being at the game. In fact, I remember my college coach, and, and I wasn't a starter. We had a really good team of seniors and juniors ahead of us. And uh, I remember my college coach, he said, hey, your dad's going to be here at this game. I go, yeah. He goes, I'll start you, which is a big deal. Now, he did that for me, knowing that it was the only time my dad would ever be there, and, and it was the second year I was playing basketball. So it was like, you know, and I think about those things and how wrong that is, Simon, and how we have damaged people with that whole thing. And we've even damaged people by making them famous or, right? Mm. And yet there's this edge of, like, I'll tell you the jealousy I have in the, in the kingdom. I have, a, I have a desire. A jealousy would be a King James word. I have a desire to see a lot of men read this book on Joshua, okay, for you, for them. So I have a desire to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I have a desire for people to read Phil Pringle's books. His book mm -hmm. on faith, they wrote in his late 20s, mm -hmm. is, is still one that I read every year, right? A little book on faith. And, and I have a jealousy for many people to see that. I would love for millions and millions of men to read that little book. I have a desire for that. So I want to make that known. Is there, I mean, you know... So I guess there's that motivation thing, right? Like, like if I want more people to listen to the podcast, my motivation is not, hey, I want to be able to walk down the street and somebody go, hey, I know that voice. Yeah, no, clearly. It's, clearly it's I want more people to hear yes, this message of freedom and clarity. And, and uh, Romans 12, 2 says, says, if you want to change your life, change the way you think. Be transformed by the power of God to change your thinking, to know the will of God, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And that's where I'd love for men that I come to, in contact with to live. I think of men, if, uh, look, the, the desire for influence, I think, is a wonderful thing. Mm. It's more enduring than fame. Yeah. You know, flames like, fame is a shooting star, yeah. but influence endures. But I think one of the ways that we could do it is by the difficult job of pacing our lives. Mm. 
I look at myself as I'm just not that important. Now, I might be important to my children and my wife, hopefully, but I'm not that important. Um, if I'm not here, God's kingdom will still continue to increase. It's not reliant upon me. So I don't look at myself as pivotal in the history of the, of the, of the earth. I look at myself as a contributor to what God's doing. But if, I, if we don't pace our lives, everything else will overtake us. All of the, so Jesus, when he became famous, he withdrew. Mm-hmm. He withdrew. Mark has him constantly in the early chapters withdrawing. Why? Well, he needed to hear what God was saying, not what the clamor of the people was saying. And I think people mistake the clamor of what the people are saying for what God's saying. Mm. That's incredibly dangerous because it'll lead to burnout. And burnout normally is attended by immorality. Mm. Somewhere on the line, they're not always mixed. In plenty of cases, they're not. But they often end up being mixed. Or financial dealings go because south. decisions because decision, decisions become clouded. We're not. You're looking for a straight. way out. Yeah. You're looking for a medicinal way out. Uh, you're looking for a quick fix, and a lot of times that'll lead into those things. Can you imagine walking yeah. down the street and every second person wants to stop you and get your autograph? Yeah. To me, that would be yeah. the most terrible thing. It'd be like my I'll be living in a cage. So now, motivation of my life then would be, I desire to live a significant life, to have influence for the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Fame comes or goes, whatever, right? And there are Christians who do become famous. Mm. But but this is my conviction. Very, very few people know how to handle fame. Yeah. Very few, Christian or otherwise. Very few people know how to handle power. Yeah. It's a rare person that can handle power without it corrupting them. Yeah. It's a rare person that can handle fame without it somehow making them think something of themselves that's not true. <laughs> yeah, because it pivots around me. And you only have to look at the, uh, the people who have won lotteries, you know, state lotteries, government lotteries, all those kinds of all over the world. And abundant stories, and the vast majority of people who have won a lottery, whether it's a million dollars or $300 million, uh, have ended up either losing all of that money. Or worse right? off. Or worse off. Because they, right. go, they go and buy a fabulous house, but they've forgotten they've got to pay taxes for the next 20 years. Well, there's that. But there was the, the man in West Virginia who won hundreds of millions of dollars and said it's the worst thing that ever happened in his life. His, his daughter ended up, his granddaughter, excuse me, ended up with money that came flowing down. And she ended up in a suicidal, ended up suicide because of a drug dependency because she had the money and now she had freedom. And, and then a number of other things happened. He ended up marrying somebody he shouldn't have married. Mm. You know, all of this stuff happened. He said, it's the worst thing that ever happened it's, to me. It's the love of money or the... Look, so I, fame. So we're equating it with fame. Uh, you know, the, this is what I, I think this is that most Christians should thank God they're not wealthy. Yeah. They should thank God. It would destroy them. Yeah. Because they've not grown up with the value of it. So, you know, when people say, oh, you know, if you believe in Jesus, you know, you'll prosper. I, uh, prosperity is different to me. Prosperous, being prosperous is different than just having money in your pocket. Okay. What it's, does it mean? It would be having wisdom. Mm. Knowing, Paul said the secret of living was learning how to deal with having much or nothing. Mm. That's where he was the genius. Whether he was, he was never rich by our standards. Whether he was comfortably well off or had nothing and was living, not even eating properly, which he faced a lot. He said... The person that can learn to be content in that, that's a genius. He said it's mm. the secret of living. I've discovered the secret of living. Wow. You know, so the secret of living is not having or not not having. It's being content with where you're at. And that's a soul that's rested in Christ. Yeah. And there's very few of us like that. Yeah. So I was, the other day I was thinking, one of the Proverbs says, um, thank God you don't have too little so that you don't end up poor and avarice. Thank God you don't have too much that you don't end up thinking too much of yourself. Well, I, I, uh, I have a friend who has, uh, his, he has a close friend in his Bible study, extremely wealthy. The guy pulled him aside one day. And he said, you know, I love what we're doing here. He said, I'm just having an issue. And he said, what's the issue? He said, I don't know who to trust. There you go. I don't know who to trust. Yeah. He said, I don't know this person, that person. I don't know who to tr- I have nobody. I don't know who to trust, man. How, and he, and he, so they started that journey of how do you do that? Now, I've got uh, one more thing. i got a comment and then one more thing. And uh, thank you, Simon McIntyre, for being on uh, Brave Men. 
podcast, taking time out of your days. You know, I flew all the way from Miami here. just to be yeah, here. Yeah, just to be Come here. On. Yeah, just for this moment. Just for you, Well, bro. the check's in the mail. <laughs> Actually, it's not in the mail yet, yeah, but when no. it is, I'll let you know. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so let me make a, a comment on that, on that whole uh, burning out for God, you know, sort of thing. I did say that when I was building my business in my 30s and 40s. You know, hey, you know, uh, we'll sleep when we die. You know, we'll sleep when we get to heaven. And I've heard that comment a lot from uh, guys. And, or, hey, I'm just going to burn out and, and just get there whenever I get there. God's got my number or whatever. Like the old, I'm going to burn out, not rust out. Yeah, exactly. It's complete folly. Yeah. It, it, well, that's what has happened in my life complete in terms folly. of balancing life. And even now, having read many of the studies that are coming out now on rest and sleep, I'm talking to men all the time now. And if you're listening right now, watching this, you know, take this, uh, the book Rest. There's a book, uh, Peter Atiyah's book on longevity. Others who talk about the importance of rest and sleep. And mm. if I want to be, listen, I want to be around for my grandchildren. I want to be around for my, it was, uh, in fact, it was Gary Clark that gave me that word years ago who pastored uh, in London. And he said, um, I, I looked at him and he was, uh, guys were having steaks and a bunch of stuff. And he had just a salad. I got to do, what are you doing, <laughs> you know? He said, this is a gift to my grandchildren. Oh, that's awesome. That's Gary. Bro, I never He's forgot smart. that. That that's was years good. ago, and I never forgot that. I shared that with him. Yeah. Because what he was doing was staying healthy yep. for his grandchildren. Yeah, absolutely. Bishop Bronner, who's our chairman of our board, I said, what's the, most, what's the best thing that happened with your dad being 50 years old when you were born? He said, he knew exactly how he wanted to raise me. I said, what was the downside? He said, my children didn't really benefit from having his, their grandfather there. So he made a deal with his children, and uh, he could, he could uh, say it yes. better. He said, I want you to get married young, uh, help you with your housing. I want you to go to school, get married, and have children. And he's got, I think uh, Bishop has uh, 11 or 12 grandchildren now at, at not an older age, and he's able to impact his grandchildren's lives. That's wonderful. And I think it's that stuff. So to me, we're coming back to sleep, rest, it's about health. I believe if you're going to have impact and be responsible for the kingdom of heaven and your responsibilities and things you have, you get rest. Uh, you, you met Judy just a moment ago. She was taking off on a walk. You know, she walks 12 miles, 12 to 15 miles a week, four different times as she'll walk. Uh, I've ticked my, I continue to tick my sleep back to where now I'm pretty regularly seven hours a night. Now, uh, I just didn't do that for years. And I'm doing that because I'm realizing and recognizing all these things are important. Right? I remember somebody saying to me once, uh, I uh, was a pastor of a big church, I live tired. It hasn't turned out too well. No, exactly. Or that whole thing well. about you're preaching so much you can't yeah, hardly talk, you're hoarse. Yeah, I live tired. Oh, I think, well, like, that's, that's a, that, to me, that's spurious spirituality. It's like patting myself on the back. By the way, this person today would uh, would laugh at what they said. Yeah. Because uh, they, they realized. Well, it was a humble brag. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we call it a humble brag. That's right, they're humble brags. Yeah, yeah, but they have no so, value. They're not biblical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're probably, they probably are more based upon, you know, Western the Western CEO. Yeah, Western productivity. It's, it's the whole thing about Western productivity was all about when the industrial age came about. Uh you knew that a town was prosperous because it was noisy. And when we talk about the wilderness and about going into the wilderness, for most Westerners, the wilderness is not productive because it has no noise involved. And that's the most productive, the lack of noise. Right. Because it slows the soul down. And like I said in that book, I think our soul walks. Mm. It doesn't run. It doesn't um, catch an airplane. And when you're in that constant rush... I feel like there's something of you that goes further and further backwards and mm. until one day there's a disconnect between you and what you've become. Mm. And, you, and it's hard to hear God's spirit when you are you know, at the peak of your powers. It's hard to hear God. Uh, I, I, I'm going to just hit you with one thing because there's a couple things. He's going to hit me. Help. But Quick, some get of them, me out of here. <laughs> some of them just take time. And... Um, so let's do this. You said in um, a comment back to somebody else on one of your blogs, is simonmcintyre.net, 
one of your blogs, you said you were encouraged by a return to historic Christianity or orthodoxy. What do you mean by that? Because to some of us who are untrained, we would think that sounds like legalism, orthodoxy, legalism, because we don't know all the terms, right? You're encouraged by a return to historic Christianity and orthodoxy. What does that mean? Um, what I see is that a lot of younger men in the Pentecostal world are actually taking more note of historic and orthodox faith, like the creeds, mm. um, like an understanding of Trinity, uh, like the meaning of salvation theologically rather than just as a point in a message. Rather than just experientially. So just the, thing. the church, we were raised in the Pentecostal era where there was a, if it, if it wasn't said specifically, it was always implied that with the, with the outpouring of the Spirit as we've seen it in the 20th century or 19th, 20th mm. century, it's almost like that's when Christianity restarted. Mm. So there's this massive hiatus of 1800 years in which people screwed as it up. Yeah, as if. Nothing it, much happened. Nothing much happened. It doesn't but, I mean, matter. that's the greatest nonsense. Yeah. Because everything we, the, the, the integrity of our New Testament is because of those hundreds of years of scholarship of thrashing things out the in first councils. three or four hundred years yeah, where the, the councils that's right were so so what we are the inheritors of something that we've despised mm. and i just think it's healthy that we see young particularly younger men and women who are returning to a the problem with this here's the problem yeah young young men and young women with good theological background can become arrogant because knowledge does mm. puff people up. Mm. That's the danger. I think people as they're older should do more theological training, do your practical training under somebody. But I'm encouraged by it. I, I see lots of pastors who are now looking at getting at least a Bachelor of Theology mm. from, from a university that's recognized rather than something that you get off the back of a cornflakes packet. Yeah. And so yeah. so and, and and there's, a thin, there's a thinness. If all you're doing is preaching messages you hear, and all you and you you're not getting background and context and understanding your messages are going to become thin they don't in other words much. you you haven't built a foundation upon which to yeah. layer these things and so we end up looking for the next hottest thing and i when i one of my questions to young pastors is what are you reading and who you're listening to mm. and how do you prepare a message and i hear guys say I listen to a great preacher and I preach his message. Mm. I'm thinking like, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Even if you are a good um, mimic yeah, of that message, yeah, that's yeah. dumb. Where are you getting food for you? Where's your food for you? Yeah, not that's, that's, that's already chewed that meat. Go and chew your own. Or at least have Brussels sprouts. Yeah, at least. Well, yeah, or, so I'm encouraged by that Roast trend. them well if you're going to have yeah, them. Yeah, I'm encouraged by the trend. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and when we speak of orthodoxy, what we're talking about is, if you will, the church fathers. We're yeah. speaking about th the guys who have worked it out mm. and, uh, you know, whatever that may be. Yep. And okay. Scripture is the foundation, foundation mm -hmm. of our faith. And, and each of those eras, they had a particular philosophical view of how things were mm. that bring a richness to Scripture. Yeah. So I think that's wonderful. If you, I don't know how many people have read... Um, Aquinas, but he's a genius. Yeah. And it, although that's not going to yeah. satisfy a lot of Protestants, but but read Augustine. <laughs> Augustine. Now these men were philosophical. Yeah. They were trained in, in Greek rhetoric, and mm. they think in ways. But they brought a they brought a, a contextualization to their own communities of what Scripture means. So I enjoy them. Yeah. My my favorite preachers are all dead. <laughs> not because I shot them. <laughs> yeah, but right. because um, C.S. Lewis is a staggering yeah, thinker. Yeah. Um, some of the great writers of, of it's, our past. It's interesting how we, uh, and I guess we're, I guess we're part of the, are we part of the evangelical world? I guess that's what we are, right? Now we're yeah. considered that. So now Pentecostals. Are, right? It's kind of gotten. Sort of morphed into charismatics. Yeah. And then morphed into evangelical. Yeah. Yeah. It's all part of that. We tend to believe the same thing. And, we, and so we tend to take actually C.S. Lewis and go, well, he was an evangelical, even though he wasn't. No, he wasn't so, really. No, he wasn't really. <laughs> no, he was Anglican. Yeah. He but, was an Orthodox Anglican. Yeah. He was 
he's he's fascinating man because I spent a day at his house uh, last summer. It's fascinating because he he really his entire life, and there was a series of setbacks, right? Grief observed, and then he didn't get the chair he wanted at Oxford, so he goes to Cambridge and all that sort of stuff. And he he did have a series of things happen to him, and uh, so he was always pushing at what is this faith about Mm. because his faith in christ actually in many ways came about through a theological or a i don't know almost philosophical kind of study of why moral law and myths yeah myths and moral law he saw all the great myths and all the moral laws and how do All those connect? Funneling to Christ. Yes. And so he said. So his belief was every culture and every age has a has a voice of God in it somewhere. Mm. That's what I think he's saying. Yeah. And that he says, and it culminated in the person of Jesus. So what? So that, and in some ways, it made what they said redundant, but it was at least leading there. If you've ever read Surprised by Joy, yeah, it uh, yeah. It, it, it would annoy most Christians exactly because it's not about it's not a testimony like we think. Mm. He just realized something. In, in all his learning and training, he realized it's pointing to somebody. You know, Simon, what I believe we need is I believe we need the C.S. Lewis's and the Max Lucados. I believe we need um, the, um, you know, whoever it may be, different streams mm. of people. I, I believe we need the different teachers and different things in order to f- the richness of being a follower of Christ. I think is because it's it's like not everybody's going to agree. Now it's Paul. Remember what he's saying in Philippians. He goes, "Hey, you may not agree with this, but but, uh, but the Lord will give you at some point an understanding. An understanding that clever, I'm right. Yeah. yeah, no, he, yeah, he's clever. Also, love too, where Paul said, you know, some say I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm yeah. of Peter. He said, don't you realize that we're all a gift yeah. to help you grow? Yeah, you're not to mean following us. Yeah. Yeah, I, we need William Seymour's, don't we? We need yeah, a man that's do. bold to stand in a pulpit without any training, yeah. without any recognition, and to proclaim something that God's wonderfully doing. Yeah, I think we need the Anglican pulpit, and we need the uh, the priest in um, you know Arequipa, Peru, who's got three hundred men going through some of our curriculum, and it's wonderful. And I, I believe we need all of that. And Simon McIntyre, I believe we need Simon McIntyre writing and speaking life into culture. And blogging, and uh, more books like Joshua. You've written like, three books now that have been published. I, right? I, they're three all self-published. Um, yeah. If well, I'm looking to pay um, my bills by publishing, I'm going to be very skinny. Well, there you go. That's not the. Um, but we need that. We need your voice, and we need what you're doing. And I realize you're going through a transition from your responsibilities. Not not C3 my gender, just in my yeah. job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> not a gender change. Yeah, okay. No, I'm not doing that this way. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, but I I just thank the Lord for you, Simon. I thank the Lord thank for you how Lord. you've ministered into my family's life. My son, Bryce, who's here with us as our producer, and my son, uh, Brandon. And then uh, in a tertiary way to my uh, daughter and her family and all of us, to Judy and I, You've been a voice, and there are moments that uh, I don't even know if I can describe some of these moments without somebody saying, wait a second, he can't do that. And I think Plastic Jesus would be... Oh, the bobblehead Jesus. Bobblehead, bobblehead. Yeah. No, you had bobblehead Jesus at one point, and then you had that one, the one that was the wind-up Jesus that you pulled out when you were speaking, and, uh, and you... <laughs> <laughs> you had it on your pulpit and it fell off. Oh, yeah. No, the, yeah I, I dropped the Messiah. Yeah, I dropped the Messiah. Yeah, that was a bad day. <laughs> then I think we got him back with a helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> the thing with the bobblehead Jesus, I called him my, uh, he was my guidance doll because he only ever said yes. <laughs> he only ever- He's the yes and amen Messiah. He's the mess- he's the Messiah that I want to have. Yeah, he I says want. yes to everything. Always yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think I think you said, oh, I think I killed him a second time. And uh, but we need that. We need that sort of thing that that pokes at our uh, seriousness about ourselves. You know. So thank you, Simon, for being Simon. Well, as I always say, Paul, if you can't laugh at yourself, you need to because everybody else is. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. Thank you. I appreciate Simon McIntyre. Simon McIntyre. Net. We'll talk about this in the show notes and some of the other things we do. But man, that was a great discussion. Thank we you, could Paul. talk about a lot of other things. I'd like to do that again in the future. Uh, but thank you, brother. God bless you, man. You and Valerie. 
and what you're carving out and the new things that you're doing, your new path and all of that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, our prayer is that every place you put your feet will be holy ground. Thank you. Everything you put your hands to will prosper and that the favor of God will cover you uh, like a, a sphere over your lives you. of you and Val I re- and I, your family. I appreciate that, in and Jesus I'm taking name. that in. Amen. Thank you. Paul. Love you.